mercy and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our text is from the Epistle Lesson from Romans 5. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. This is our text. Dear friends in Christ, when the bird was in the building, I was desperately trying to figure out how I could work a bird into my sermon. I knew you would all be thinking about this. But as it turned out, the bird was a Roman Catholic and left before the service started. <laughs> Maybe I can work the bird in a bit later, too. G.K. Chesterton, who is one of the great apologists of Christianity in the 20th century, was famous for his one-line quips, and one of them goes this way. Chesterton said that the only Christian doctrine that can be verifiable in experience is the doctrine of original sin. First of all, we have the experience of our own depravity. Second of all, we have the experience of the depravity of every person around us. It's pretty clear. But the fact is that people suspect that the doctrine of original sin is the invention of the crabby Christian church and her spoil sport theologians. How could it be said that we're liable for the sin of some ancient ancestor way back there in some garden someplace so that his sin obligates all human beings into the future and brings death into the world. Indeed, there are many people, even so-called Christian theologians, who would argue that Adam is simply a fictional character. He can never really exist. He's a mythical projection of the ancient mind. Of course, we're so much smarter today, aren't we? Hmm? This ancient mind that wants to answer the question, why is there sin? And why is there mortality? So they think of Adam as the answer. And in fact, we might argue that the doctrine of original sin is downright un-American. Oh, well, and we might be right about that. We all think that every person can pull himself up by his bootstraps, no matter what his ancestry might have been. We don't care if you're pink, polka dot, green, or whatever. You're a human. And you ought to get on to living. But it seems downright oppressive to teach people that they're sinners because they were born of sinners. How are we supposed to recover from that? It's just not fair! problem is that we don't get to define what fair is. We don't get to make up what justice is. Oh, of course, there are all kinds of crazy theories out there today about what is fair and what is not, what is just and what is not. And these views are entirely human-centered. Of course, they always point out that you are a sinner. What's just about that? The first place to start should be with me. I'm a sinner. The fact is that our human views of justice are most often unjust.
So, what's happening is that there's no salvation. There's no saving in such thing. Everybody has just simply fallen into the pit of depravity. And there's no way up. The contention that there was no Adam, no fall, no original sin, leaves people sunk in their depravity with no hope of rescue. To deny that you're in the pit doesn't help at all. Occasionally, you have seen on the Southwest Freeway a vehicle where one of the tires has gone completely flat. The driver doesn't stop. The driver keeps going until the rims start to go flat. And then they're going bumpity, bumpity, bumpity along the interstate. And they just keep going. And they start to tear the suspension out of the vehicle. And then it becomes entirely unsteerable, and they end up crash, crashing someplace along the way. The point is that denying reality is not a very productive strategy for any endeavor. To deny original sin simply gets us in a wreck at the end. And as is typical of humans, we want to spend more time arguing that it's unfair, unjust, and wrong for God to declare me guilty of somebody else's sin. It just isn't right. When we would be far better off to admit the pickle we're in, Then see what God has done so spectacularly to draw us out of this pit into which we've fallen because of Adam's sin. For God wants to haul us out of that pit. And he wants to put new tires on life. As I sat here before service, willing the bird out of the building, I wondered how I could communicate with the bird and say, if you'll head toward this door, things will work out swimmingly. And as you notice, I succeeded. Which of course proves something you've known a long time, that I'm a bit of a bird bird. <laughs> But more seriously, how do you convince the bird, if you're not a bird, that that is the way out and that it's safe to go that way? How do you convince the humans that God has rescued us from the pit of our own sin and depravity unless you become one of them. Unless you get right down into the pit of despond to drag them up out of it. And that is the meaning of the incarnation. The solution that God gives for our depravity. So for us Christians, and only for us, not even for that bird, he left before the message got delivered. Only for us Christians is this question of original sin no problem. Am I worried about my original sin? Of course not. Why? Because I believe in the second Adam Christ who has taken on my sin by becoming a human like me that he might swallow it all down being the guilt swallower and taking it all away. 
if I believe that I am one with Adam in his sin, and I believe it, then I also believe that I am one with Christ in his righteousness. The second Adam overcomes what has been done by the first. What if I were a filthy beggar? We had a, a filthy beggar outside the doors for the wedding yesterday, and uh, the police obliged us by, by taking him away. Sad case. If I were a filthy beggar, and someone gathered me up, say a great king or prince, and took me to his castle, and there cleaned me up, and fed me, and clothed me in a new suit of clothing, and made me the prime minister of his country, and brought me before his glittering court, would I not be so willing to say that the king came into my gutter and picked me up and took care of me and cleansed me and clothed me and covered over my filth and brought me to his court and honored me by making me his prime minister. Would I be afraid to say I was just a stinking beggar? Of course not. Why? Because this would make doubly clear how gracious my Lord was to me. And that's what all of you are. You've been picked up by your Lord and made kings and priests in his kingdom. You've been made prime minister and you've been clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ through your baptism. That's who you are. And so it is for those like us who in Adam were perishing in our sin and our filth have been rescued by God and elevated by His righteousness so that we become the very sons of God. The fact is, what I can say about myself in Adam, I can also say about myself in Christ. And Christ certainly supersedes what Adam has done. Because of original sin, faith is impossible. Theologians will sometimes babble about the leap of faith as though it's something we Christians did. Hey, watch this, I'm going to make the leap of faith. And you're standing on the edge of the gorge you can't see the bottom, you can't see the other side. Hey, let's jump! As though we're some kind of spiritual Indiana Jones. Teenagers will have no idea what I'm talking about. If faith is just that kind of leap, faith is nothing but sheer terror. It's not the faith of which the Bible speaks at all. I've had the privilege of going a number of times to Niagara Falls. I lived not far from there when I was a child. And it didn't matter how many times I went and stood hanging onto that seemingly fairly little railing right at the edge of the gorge, watching the water leap out over the cliff and go down into that pit. I would stand there gripping as hard as I could that metal railing and then when I lifted my hands off, there was this little sweaty pool where I was hanging on. My hands were sweating terribly. I hate that scene, watching that water rush over the edge. It's terrifying. And all the more so when you think about the fact that several maniacs have gotten into barrels and gone over the thing. God does not ask us to make a leap of death. 
for we can never bridge the chasm between unbelief and faith. It's unbridgeable by us. We would be left spiritually exhausted, palms still sweating upon the edge of faith if this is all we know about faith. As though it were a leap into the unknown. Faith's impossibility is a divine requirement. But you're saying, wait, wait, Pastor, I have faith. Yes, you do. Why? Because with God, nothing is impossible. You have to understand that faith is ever and always a divine gift. We can never bridge that chasm on our own at all. The gorge between faith and unbelief has long ago been traversed by Christ. He's not contained by the terrors of death, but can rise triumphant out of death's roiling chasm. He could span the gap between faith and unbelief as he spanned the gap between heaven and earth as his arms were stretched out in death to pay for the sins of the world, to pay for my sins, your sins, and even the sins of that bird. Despite the fact that he's a wrong Catholic. On the cross, Jesus was stretched out between the unbelieving world and faith. And he granted to that world the gift of life. He teaches us on the cross what it means to be afraid. Oh, he's not afraid. He stands gazing on the edge of faith looking where he ought to look, into the very heart of his God and Father. And yet, in forsakenness, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet, unlike us, he remains completely certain of the rescue that only his Father can provide. He knows that his God will not let him see decay, and so he abandons himself completely to the will of his Father, leaping into the chasm of death, supremely confident of rescue, and in his rescue, all of our own. And so we look into the unbridgeable chasm by faith, and what do we see there? The heart and mind of Christ. Not some bottomless pit. We see the heart and mind of Christ who is in his own life giving himself for us. In his death and resurrection, he discloses the fully gracious attitude of God to poor sweating sinners like us. The chasm is bridged by his suffering and death. We leap not into the unknown, but into the arms of Christ outstretched in death, spattered with blood, to be embraced by God's Son and covered up by his blood, which cleanses us from all sin. Now, it may not be politically correct in these COVID-19 days, but I want to be embraced by this Jesus and blooded by Him. We stand upon the immovable cross as we go to Calvary's quake crack hill. We come to the only way to cross the gorge between faith and unbelief. We come to the cross. We see God's true love for us in the very eyes of Jesus, who, as he dies, 
their light goes out. And yet we see. We are in the arms of Christ, who has reconciled us to God through his death. This is what God wants you to know about him. Faith itself, of course, remains ever a gift of God. Not our own work, of course. And that's why the Apostle Paul can say so beautifully, I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he, he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Even on judgment day, I will be perfectly certain that what I have has been granted to me by a gracious God, and I will stand righteous before my God on that day. That faith is always in Christ. It's not to sleep into the darkness. It's always in the one who gives us mercy from our God. Faith is always in something. It's in Christ. Dr. Mark Luther said, if you ask where faith and confidence may be found, or where they come from, it is certainly the most necessary thing to know. First, without any doubt, it does not come from your own works or merits. That sounds like you feel all right. But only from Jesus Christ, freely promised and freely given. As St. Paul writes in Romans 5, God showed his love toward us as exceedingly sweet and kind in that Christ died for us while we were yet good people. No, that's not right. While we were yet sinners. It doesn't get any better than that. This is as if, says Luther, Paul said, Shouldn't this give us a strong, invincible, undefeatable confidence in that before we prayed about it, or even cared about it, yes, while we were continually walking in sin, Christ died for our sins. Here is what faith is for. Here is what faith is in. It's in Christ himself. It's in his death. It's in his blood. Oh yes, fallen sinner I am. Redeemed by Christ I am. Yes. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all human understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise.